Before I introduce the panel, the star panel that I have here, this is really significant for us because we started our careers here in Edinburgh, you know? Um, I started bartending here in, in 2007 uh, in, in Opal Land when it was good back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Edinburgh is such a significant significant city for us and we've all been working together at one point not at the same bar but at the same sort of time so to come back here and to do a panel together this is my first one moderating it this is uh, Mike's first panel as well this is huge for us so um, thank you for being a part of it um, so without further ado this is the panel this is us we are the dram busters and we're going to be talking mm. about why you should be using scotch in cocktails. So, first up, I have Ryan Chetty Award winner here. I want to know from you, how did you start drinking whiskey? And were there any rules around scotch when you started drinking it? Um, I think with all of us here, and I, I presume most of the people in the crowd, there's probably two encounters with whiskey that I had, and that was one as a, as a youth. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was particularly a, a really, you know, a, a, a really old and dear friend of mine who, who comes from a very old English family, um, which means that he was eternally pickled. Um, and, <laughs> but it also meant we had great things around. We were drinking fine claret and really nice ports and things like that. And the, the jewel in that was always whiskey. And it was quite nice because as youngsters, again, this sounds bad, but we were kind of exposed <laughs> to it in a, in a positive way. It was kind of like, this is the, the, the kind of pinnacle of, 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 of kind of drinking, I suppose. Um, and it was, yeah, it was, it was, we weren't necessarily the most respectful of it at the time, and there wasn't um, a huge amount of rules around, but it was this, this kind of reverence for it. Um, and then I suppose the other time was when I was, as a young bartender, and I was really fortunate to have actually great mentors and peers throughout my whole um, time as a bartender. And um, it was really then when I started really drinking it in a different way. And firstly, being exposed to, to bourbon um, and then to scotch. But I suppose at that time, there was still a period where you didn't really do much with scotch. Um, it was very much that it was drunk neat. So I think even from, uh, from, from both sides, there was this kind of set of rules around it, I suppose. Right, so that's what we're gonna be discussing today, mm -hmm. these supposed rules around how we should be drinking whiskey. Next up. I have Mike Aikman. Mike is actually a massive mentor of mine. Um, he is owner of Bramble and Lucky Liquor and The Last Word. Um, and yeah, this is amazing. So Mike, same question to you. My uh, initial experience of, of whiskey is somewhat different to Ryan's actually. <laughs> uh, you might be surprised to hear. Uh, growing up in Fife, there wasn't a lot of... Uh, <laughs> There wasn't a lot of uh, luxury involved. Um, <laughs> so in my sort of mid-teens, my dad was a whiskey fan. He was a, a, a whiskey drinker, uh, still is. And uh, so he kind of let me try the odd thing sort of in my teens. And the rule was um, malts were good, blends were bad. Never mix whiskey, nothing. No water at that point, no water, no nothing, no ice, anything. So the first thing I did was drink blends, usually bells, because it was cheapest, with iron brew. That was how I started. <laughs> usually in a pint glass. Uh, and it's kind of, it's quite interesting, because it's kind of come full circle now, because now I kind of teach him about whiskey. So and you're still drinking warm whiskey and iron brew <laughs> from a pint glass. <laughs> I mean, it's not my regular tipple now, but, you know, if it's a choice between that and nothing, I'll definitely <laughs> go with that. And last but not least, we have Tom Walker, who started off here, moved to London, and has now crossed the Atlantic and is heading up Fresh Kills in Brooklyn. Tom, how did you start drinking whiskey? Well, I guess, I guess we, we only really decided on both answers bef about five minutes before this presentation. <laughs> so the more, um, you know, the more sophisticated one, I actually tried it when I was, when I was living in Australia about maybe seven or eight years ago, um, and it wasn't, it wasn't anything else other than, um, I think I tried scotch once, once or twice, this is my personal experience, and I remember finishing work one night, and there was no other specific reason other than I just, I wanted a malt, um, and that was it. Uh, there was no, really, no real rationale behind it, and I remember trying, um, I think it was a Talisker, um, and it hit, it hit the spot like a, like a glass of water does on a, 
on a warm, on a warm summer's day. It was amazing. Um, but technically, the first time I tried it, I think, I think my mum gave me some dinner money, and I saved it all up. <laughs> and then I bought, I bought, it's just true, I bought a bottle of, uh, bottle of Bells, and then I kept it under my bed, and I would, I would have a... A, <laughs> <laughs> a sneaky dram before school. Yeah, or maybe, a, <laughs> maybe a not so sneaky dram before school, mate. Um, that was my first experience with it. I remember like one, one time, I, one morning, I, I went, uh, I caught up with a friend, and we usually go in the sweet shop, and he's not. And he said, are you not coming in? And I just laughed at him, and he went, you stink. <laughs> I was about 15, but I don't condone <laughs> underage drinking, obviously. <laughs> and neither does Jewers. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> I just want to set the scene. So a guy and a girl just walk into a bar, just, just any old bar around the world, right? And um, they go in for an aperitivo pre-dinner, and you reach for a bottle of gin or a bottle of vermouth and mix up something with that. They come in after dinner and they ask for a digestif and, and you do the same thing. You re reach for gin or vodka or anything like that. Yet over a third of probably your bar is whiskey. It is a huge area behind the bar which isn't being utilized. Now, obviously we love it, right? We've pretty much grown up on it um, in one way or another legally. Um, you love it as well. Bartenders, we love scotch whiskey, right? We like to, we like to uh, sip it neat. We like to have it with beer. We might occasionally shoot it. You know, on the odd occasion, you'll mix it, but just not enough. And I know I might be biased with this, but I truly believe that Scotch whiskey is the most diverse of all spirit categories out there with a plethora of flavors from your super, super light, floral, grassy sort of stars of whiskey into your big, boisterous sort of smoky Isla whiskeys, okay? There is so much to play with there, and we need to stop being so precious about it. And so that's what we're going to do here. We're going to analyze why are we not using it enough in Scotch cocktails, or if we are, what are we doing with it, what flavors work with it, etc. But to set the scene with this, so you actually know the size of the whiskey prize. Yeah? The second biggest spirits category by volume is whiskey. The second biggest. But by value, Whiskey, so we're talking American whiskey, Irish whiskey, Japanese whiskey, Scandinavian whiskey, Scotch whiskey. By volume, uh, sorry, value wise, it is the biggest category. Okay? Um, there are 3.5 billion bottles of whiskey sold around the world every year, and that accounts to 60 billion pounds. Dollars. Dollars. <laughs> It's fluctuated which one's worth more. Yeah, it's not, it's, <laughs> they're, they're, not, they're not that different nowadays. Yeah, right. Actually, yeah. Um, but out of that, Scotch accounts for $28 billion of that, right? So Scotch whiskey within that is the biggest part of the pie of the biggest part of the pie. It's a huge opportunity. Yet, in the top 50 cocktails from 2015, there were three Scotch drinks. You can probably guess what they were. The Rob Roy, the penicillin, and that delightful drink known as the blood and sand. Hands up here who likes the blood and sand. Right, yeah, there we go. You're all exactly. twisted. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a split panel on this as well. I, I, oh, God, it's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what we're going to do, first of all, we're going to look at the past. This is step split into three bits, past, present, and future. So first of all, we're going to look at the past, and we're going to look what happened in the past to sort of set us up today to why we don't use it as much. So in the past, Scotch did play a significant role in the development of cocktail culture. It had a huge part to play, um, but we forgot about it shortly afterwards. Um, and it came to fame originally, hugely, because of one little bug. So when Floxa hit over in the USA, obviously we couldn't get brandy any, brandy any more or cognac, so bartenders started turning to Scotch whiskey, okay? Um, and that's a nice little quote from Imbibe. Imbibe is a fantastic book. I was reading through it recently. It's awesome. Um, and so what we're going to do is look at six noteworthy cocktails throughout this period that really defined sort of the building up of this cocktail culture and the role that Scotch had to play in all six of them. So first up, we have the toddy. Do you like the toddy? Thoughts on the toddy? It's fine. Isn't oh, great. It, isn't this, <laughs> fine. It's isn't fine. this just the penicillin served hot? 
<laughs> Let's call a spade a spade, Ryan. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the toddy's interesting for me because I, I almost don't really think of it as a cocktail. It's more of a yeah. medicinal thing for me. It's something that you would have when you're ill. You. And I wouldn't drink uh, any other cocktail when I was ill. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So the toddy actually came to fame in the 1700s. Um, back then, whiskey wasn't what it is today. We didn't have our skilled whiskey blenders back then and our whiskey barons. Um, and maturation laws weren't what they were today. So whiskey was pretty shocking. It was really rough around the edges. And so we would mix it, you know? And so that's how really the toddy came to be. And then the first mention of it was in 1750 in the Boston Weekly Post. And that's when it came into print, and that was the first chance of it. Um, and actually, we as Jewers, uh, we were inspired by this. So you've seen things like this in the past. We actually created a toddy whiskey, which jumped onto that. But as Mike just said, it's now seen as a bit of a medicinal drink that we don't really, we don't really call to. And you see so many substitutions that scotch has almost been forgotten as the original toddy ingredient, right? So next up, we have the blue blazer. <coughs> which I actually before this thought was a rum drink, which is really ignorant on my behalf. But I did. I always thought that the Blue Blazer was a rum drink. I think it's because we've got a rum bar in Edinburgh, which is called the Blue Blazer, probably. Um, but of course, this was created by the legendary Professor Jerry Thomas. Um, but again, this quote's really interesting because it came to fame, and then what happens? People just started using other spirits in it. Bartenders did what bartenders do, you know. And so throughout this, we're going to be looking at, is this us or is this them? Us being the whiskey industry, are we the ones that are doing it or is it bartenders? And in this case, well, we, we forgot about it, right? Um, next, we have the highball. Yeah. A contested first mention, um, originally created for Patrick Duffy, um, by Patrick Duffy, sorry, but also Tommy Dewar also uh, says quotes that he was the guy that first created it. Um, I'm not going to go into that argument right now. <laughs> um, I, I love a highball. I know you love a highball. It's pretty, probably my favorite drink. Yeah. Um, it's the drink I, I definitely turn to most when I'm out and about. Um, and it's, yeah, it's very much a desert island drink of mine. In fact, I remember once we had a conversation and you said that you turn to a highball when you're in a dodgy bar because you know that the whiskey's always going to be good yeah. and the soda's <laughs> always going to be clean and you don't have to worry yeah, about it's, any it's, of that. It's, it's, the, <laughs> it's the, I suppose this is one of the reasons why people end up uh, kind of keeping scotch in this hallowed position, but because you know it's always going to be a certain way, it's not never going to be underproof, it's never going to be adulterated with something, it's always going to be... Uh, you can order it everywhere, and it's always going to be a solid drink. I think it's a phenomenal drink, yeah. and I think it's something that we don't play on enough. If bars do gin and, gin and tonic menus, why are we not doing highball menus? Why are we not pairing specific garnishes with our whiskey? Why are we not flaring with it more? Why are we not showcasing this amazing drink? And the highball, which was originally a whiskey highball, has now turned into just a category of drinks. The highball, it could be anything. It's two ingredients over ice with maybe, you know garnish thrown in there for fun and a bit of color. But it was whiskey, it is whiskey, and we need to appreciate that. And so the question is, is we, we don't accept it, but if the Mizuwari serve in, um, in Japan is an accepted serve everywhere across Japan, simple sort of high, uh, sorry, a long serve of whiskey and water, why can we not showcase scotch and soda more? You can take the point even further because that's, that's not the only drink that's representative of um, either scotch drinkers or whiskey, gin, whiskey drinkers in Japan. They mix it with things like cocoa, coconut water and green tea. Not once, you know, it's, it, it, it's not even a case of it getting questions. It's just outright accepted. It's like you don't drink scotch one way, you can drink it many ways. Or you don't drink um, whiskey one way, you can drink it many ways. While over here it's... You know what I mean? You can, almost, you can almost feel someone kind of like turn the nose up here and, and turn the head away when, it's, uh, when you talk about something like a scotch and soda or even something maybe a bit more left field in this part of the world like a scotch and coconut water or a scotch and green tea. Um, Sacrilege. Yeah. How dare yeah, you yeah. mix my whiskey? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's true. It's your whiskey in your glass and you do what you <clears> want with it. But this is to inspire you to be a little bit more creative with it. Um, who, hand up who's tried a whiskey and coconut water. What do you think? You like it? It's phenomenal. For me, it's almost like a detox retox in the same <laughs> glass. 
<laughs> That's what I tell myself anyway when I'm drinking it. Um, and actually, uh, throughout history, the highball was always prominent. Scotch and soda, you know, it's been around since, well, this is a bit of advertising, but since the 1890s, there's a scotch and soda. <clears throat> we then go into the 1900s, scotch and soda. 1930s, scotch and soda. 1970s, scotch and soda. It's always been there. It's always been a part of it, especially when it comes down to blended whiskey. So we need to revive it more. We need to be doing more with this. One bar I particularly love at the moment, which is doing incredible stuff, is actually Black Rock. They've got a highball menu, and they're, they're mixing whiskey with everything, and they're tailoring uh, their mixer to go with the whiskey itself, bringing out those nuances, as I said, just like you would do with a gin and tonic, tailoring your garnishes to pair with the botanicals. Um, so that is our scotch and soda. We then go into the Rob Roy. Terrible drink. <laughs> <laughs> you mean serious? Yeah. <laughs> What's your point, Carl? Yeah, I, I just... Mate, it's your world, I'm I, just living in I it. Just, I, <laughs> don't rate it. Sorry. Bobby Burns? Much better. Ah, well, I guess you're all right. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's, it's too, it's, it's too one-dimensional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, you did something with it at Bramble, right? Well, yeah, it's an affinity, which also is a terrible drink. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but don't put yourself down, eh? Yeah? Unadulterated <laughs> is a terrible drink. Um, but this was one of the things, it was Jason, my business partner, it was more him than me, but we, we made an affinity fresh, which is similar. I think you're talking about it later on, are you? Uh, about yeah, the, we're talking about yeah. that one. So this whole whiskey, um, vermouth, bitters, and that's pretty much... The, the basis of the Rob Roy, the Affinity, and, and quite a few others that we'll touch on. Um, but as a basic um, grounds for a drink, it, it doesn't work for me. It needs something else. And the Bobby Burns, you know, it, it's a just cut above the bar. for me. Yeah, it just it uh, adds more complexity. Yeah, I think this plays affinity. to your point, though. It's, it, it's not about, it's not being tailored. Um, and I think there is certain affinities, you know, with gins and driving moves, you get that affinity together. And I think a lot of the time, the affinity between a lot of vermouths is, is, is not tailored towards the scotch. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, people aren't taking the care to pair those things together. And so you're just getting a Rob Roy uh, following a standard formula, following this is the whiskey, this is the vermouth, and this is therefore going to work. Yeah, like um, that, two parts, one part, and then yeah. a dash. They read the specs, but they don't think about what vermouth would go better with what yeah. whiskey they're using in that, and yeah. play with the <clears throat> ratios of that a little bit more, and then looking at bitters and things as well, different yeah. bitters. It's, it, yeah, it's a, it's, a lazy, it's a lazy approach to take, to just be like, well, this is how we're going to do it. Uh, what do you think? The drink doesn't work. <laughs> All right, okay, that's it. Well, Instead of like looking at it, you just move away from the drink or you move away from scotch and it's like, well, that doesn't really address the issue. But you've done something with it, which is what you've got in right. your first glass in front of you. So yep. this is a bit, did you like that? Seamless. <laughs> Seamless. <laughs> Great segue. Um, twists on classics and here we go. Tom Walker. Yeah, okay. So like there's, there's a couple of different uh, uh, angles with regards to the Montgomery. Um, for, for a long time, I, I don't think there's been um, enough... Um, scotch drinks which have been approachable so you know without sounding patronizing like an like an entry-level scotch drink like a level one um, it generally seems to be that if uh, if you have a, a smoked a smoked whiskey or an isla whiskey it's fine because it's going to stand up to everything um, if you don't then we don't know how to use it or it you know people don't know how to utilize it so the kind of you know the skirt around the edges and then and then the idea of an approachable scotch drink generally gets abandoned so if we, if we take this this rob roy um slash whiskey vermouth category and put it to one side this is this is essentially um a scotch old fashion for uh, for beginners um it's it's a it's a good amount of whiskey um you can use 57, either 57 yeah which is i think precisely. it's it's uh, it, the, tran the transliteration, <laughs> the transliteration in terms of measurements is is 2.25 ounces, and then you have um, 12 and a half, 12 and a half mils of orange curacao, which is um, it's one part simple syrup, um, cut with uh, Pierre Ferrand uh, dry curacao, so it just it regulates the ABV, and then and then chocolate bitters. So on paper, what you have is uh, number one, you have a you have a Scotch old fashioned where there's no smoke whatsoever. Number two. Uh, 
Um, you have uh, chocolate and orange flavors where scotch uh, plays a big part in that. So I probably should have maybe referenced Don French because it actually tastes like a Terry's chocolate orange um, <laughs> with scotch. Yeah. But, uh, but, I mean, that, that, was, that was it. It was just it was to create something approachable that was um, gender neutral, that, that didn't kind of slant either towards one specific sex or a specific type of whiskey drinker. Um, but I think going back to that point we were making about the tailing to the whiskeys, that's, you know, with Aberfeld, it's got that waxy orange note to it as well. Yeah, so bold together, and it, thick, yeah, and fat. It's mm. great. And, oh, um, fat. you know, and, and without <laughs> meaning to cast a generalization and, and slag off other whiskey categories, but... Um, <laughs> well, you're going to anyway. So yes. anyway. <laughs> um, if, if you take American whiskey, it's in a camp of sweet, rich, toffeed butterscotch. And, it, you know, you can... Uh, throw a, a variety of flavors at it, and you kind of know how it's going to work. Of course, there's nuances to, to American whiskey, but I think it's very hard to apply that generalization to scotch. Yeah, totally. Um, and so when you're throwing generic flavors at it, 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 it's very hard to get that, to showcase it in that way that you want the spirit to shine. Um, and I think this is a, is a great example because it's absolutely Aberfeldy at the heart of it. Yeah. 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 Great. Pick up your glass. Turn to the person next to you, cheers them, thank them for joining you on this occasion. This is cheers. what whiskey's cheers. all about. Cheers. Good. Cheers. Yeah, Good. Well done with the cheers. That's Sorry? A great, that's a great idea. People yeah. actually Good. are cheers. Good. It's pretty good, Tom. Uh, cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Bartender's You're practice. welcome. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's All right, it. moving on with our classic six cocktails that sort of really, really built up um, the cocktail revolution. Uh, we have the punch. Great cocktail. Um, and here you've got the cold whiskey punch. Um, and then fine, I've got no notes on it, actually. It's just the punch. That's what it is. But we don't use scotch enough in it because, you know, we call for punch with ramen or gin or anything like that. But again, not whiskey. So time to change that. And finally, the fizz. So morning glory fizz, which you like. Awesome drink. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. Yeah. amazing. Yeah. Massive, Great drink. massive fan. Um, and scotch has always been a part of it. Again, we need to see this more. We need the birth, or sort of the rebirth, of the fizz. And I think the, the morning glory is really interesting as well, because not to condone breakfast drinking, but it's like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Again, uh, the, the idea to me of turning to a Bloody Mary is just the, the wrong yeah. thing to, to consider in, 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 in a brunch or a, a morning scenario. And so, so many times people will go to gin drinks. And don't get me wrong, things like a Corpse Survivor, of, 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 the name is very fitting. It, it works wonderfully. Number two, of course. But um, <laughs> the, the Morning Glory is... It, it, I, I've served this blue, several yeah. times at brunches, and it's without doubt been the favorite. It's always been the one that people are most surprised by and going... You know, a lot of those things sound scary to people. Scotch for breakfast, probably should have rephrased that. And, <laughs> and, and absinthe. And a lot of times friends are, you know, particularly not... Um, you know, people who aren't from, the, the, from our industry and our world, um, they, they wouldn't really gravitate to those kind of serves uh, for in that scenario because they've been programmed to go to white spirits and um, cold soups. Um, but it's... <laughs> uh, you know, the... The, the morning glory is, is, is kind of perfect. It's everything you want in that bright, eye-opener style. Yeah, you want a nice palate cleanser, mm -hmm. like, right? You don't want a thick, tomato-y, gloopy... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree 100%. Do you, do you think the drink's an anomaly, though? A little bit, yeah. Because, like, on, on I, I love the drink. I think it's great. But on paper, uh, it's got scotch egg white and absinthe. I, th I, th I think it's that great. I, I like it. I'm just playing, playing devil's advocate. It's almost like the drink, I think, uh, one of the reasons why it's not as big as it should be, although it's relatively well known within the category of Scotch drinks, is that it's kind of held prisoner. We'll talk a little bit about this more with regards to the, the blood and sand, but it's almost like the ingredients kind of hold it prisoner hmm. because it's like, it's a victim, you know what I mean? It's like, right there, you've got the power of three. Scotch, yeah. scotch, egg, white, and absinthe, mm -hmm. and it's like one of those is almost enough to turn people off, never yeah. mind three of them. I don't know, it works for that's me on paper. Point. I look at it on paper and think <laughs> that's <sounds great. laughs> But you never see it on menus. No. Right. Like, no, you right. never see it on menus. You know, you see all these classic drinks, and people really kind of harken back to drinks of old, and you look when that was invented, and it's like, and it does, it works. A well made version's amazing, but. Very, very rarely do you see it on menus. Yeah. I just, I don't understand. Or don't do, you, do you get a good one, even if it is made? 
Well, well you know, yeah. that's another, yeah. well, that's whole, another, another panel entirely, right? Um, now, Tom actually made a really good point. So we've gone through all of these six cocktails. None of them are really ownable, though, to scotch, you know? We saw there are variations. You saw the quote from, um, <coughs> from Imbibe saying that bartenders did what bartenders do. I'm not making a generalization. You're amazing. Um, but the, the Blue Blazer was originally with scotch and then just used anything else. But none of them are ownable apart from that one drink. Yeah, I mean, the, when, when we were putting this together, um, uh, each, each drink for me... Um, the fizz, the fizz, a little less so, but still, they're all, they're all representative of a category. They're not representative of, of, of what Scotch cocktails are as an entity, um, either like culturally or, or historically. Uh, the Rob Roy is a Scotch Manhattan. Um, the Blue Blazer, albeit originally made with Scotch, got subbed out for other, for other spirits, and the same with the Hot Toddy. Um, and it's, yeah, I, th I, think, I think it's a shame that essentially, in, instead of something specifically being, um, you know, something that, that Scotch could call its own, it doesn't, apart from one drink, which is a blood and sand. And my argument with this, I guess we'll come back to it a lot, is um, I think with regards to phylloxera in it coming over to Europe and, um, you know, technology and with regards to transportation and, and you know, the, the world is, the population of the world is growing, more people are coming into the world, more people are getting richer, more people are traveling. They bring with them tastes, um, you know, especially when we look at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, they bring with them um, tastes and things that they want and they want things quicker and they don't want to wait for it. Um, and then what you have, like at, 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 the, peak, at the peak of this culture is um, someone made a blood and sand because they were like, I think we should maybe try and break out of this, this you know, these categories that, 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 that that Scotch can't call their own, and they made a blood and sand, and then someone was just like, "That's rubbish. Let's just <laughs> let's just not bother ever again." <laughs> you know what I mean? Let's let's just go back to the three, four ingredient drinks with gin or American whiskey or cognac. Now that it's available again, you know, someone someone tried to be creative and inventive, and they made they made an awful drink. <laughs> And someone went, nah, you're all right, we'll just, uh, we'll, go, we'll go back to what it was before. But in all fairness, there isn't a lot of inspiration, and that's probably why they did it. They mixed, you know, blood and sand was originally mixed just for its color. I can believe that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can totally believe that. We, um, we still do that nowadays. <laughs> more that. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, but yeah, there, wasn't, there isn't a lot of inspiration. Now this, this is an incredible cocktail book, right? The old Waldorf Astoria bar book. In this book, there are 265 cocktails. Nine of them. Nine. Cool for Scotch whiskey. And all of those nine are the same Holy Trinity combination of whiskey, French or Italian vermouth, and bitters. How many of those do you like, Mike? <laughs> uh, approximately zero. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, from the very fundamentals, there really hasn't been inspiration for today. So no wonder Actually, we don't know what to do with yeah, it. Yeah, because yeah. if that's the only thing, then the only way that it's being flaunted, that's not much. On top of that, you have quotes like this, yeah? Whiskey is a grouchy old bachelor that stubbornly insists on maintaining its own independence and is seldom to be found in a marrying mood, yeah? And that still reigns through to today. To today, we've got a quote coming up as well, which kind of emphasizes on this. And this was from 1948, but it's still true, right? Um, so are our bartenders of today still looking at this? Or is it what we're doing right now that's the problem? David Embry is probably my favorite cocktail book, but sometimes he's just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> he's just wrong. Um, OK, so next up, what are we doing? Oh, yeah, advertising. Yeah, so we look at advertising. So as, as I said, this is going to be almost like an us versus them sort of thing. Us being whiskey industry, them being, you know, people that are using whiskey. Let's look at advertising. Has advertising been too polarizing? Now, typically when we look at advertising, obviously you saw um, the use of the highball and from a blended whiskey perspective, scotch has always been sort of advertised to be long with soda or lemonade or ginger ale or anything like that. But then you have this, whiskey advertised as an aspirational drink with that guy with the gleaming smile with that bottle of red label. Um, this is how, well, there's two sides to it actually, so we, and I'm going to stop on the next one. We have advertising like this, and then we have advertising like this. <laughs> oh, geez. Oh, geez. Yeah? 
This is advertising as well. Whiskey goes on both ways. It's completely polarized. I had to get some sort of attention at this time. <laughs> well, I should about hurt my neck. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, is, is, it us? is this, I mean, what is this? What are we doing can we, here? Can we go back to the previous slide in a minute? I just want to say the guy, the guy on the far right, doesn't he look like a cross between Ron Burgundy and, and Don Draper? <laughs> There's nothing you want more after a hard game of squash than a shot of whiskey for it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's nailed it there, right? <laughs> but this further cements that stereotype and everything that we're working against within, within whiskey. The fact that whiskey is only drunk is by sort of um, old white guys, pretty much. That, that's how whiskey has been, has been advertised in the past, right? Yeah. So you either have that or you, or, or, or you have that, which, you know, further goes to show that whiskey is drunk just by men um, and women are just used for pinups, which is fucking awful. <laughs> and that's even going up to the 90s. Yeah, no, that's from yeah. the 90s as well. Uh -huh. The Cutty Stark ones are from the 1990s. That's still what it was like then. It's awful. This, this might seem like a, like, a, like a bit of an odd comparison, but <laughs> if you, bear with me, if you, uh, if you think about like specific, specific cocktail uh, cultures or like time frames, um, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I'm the only person <laughs> that thinks that, I, generally speaking, tiki was one of the longest, uh, one of the longest generations of, of cocktail making within the last 150 years. I think it was maybe, maybe about 40, 30 or 40 years worth of tiki culture or tiki drinking habits existed, um, which is quite impressive considering how, how fast-paced this industry and this cocktail culture is now. And even back then, if you look at, if you look at the advertising uh, that, that Georgia highlights, the advertising stretches to... 50, 60 years, the message is the same, but so is, so is the culture. How, how, many, how many advertising companies, th this is you know, an open-ended question, how many advertising companies or spirit companies would have the same, uh, the same message, whatever, but the same, the same style of advertising for 50 plus years? Just us. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so that was the past. We're now moving through to the present, and we'll talk about the drink that you've got in front of you in a minute, <laughs> bypassing that. Um, this is the present. This is a quote uh, that was uh, put out in 2000, and when was this, 2010? No, 2011. Yeah. yeah. Whiskey will never have the mixability of vodka or bourbon. Those strong, peaty flavors dominate everything, says who reckons the future for blended whiskey lies with completely new brands. Every single whiskey brand out there has far too much historical baggage attached to it. The whiskey industry has to have the courage to launch products with completely new packaging. This is a very well-known, well-respected industry person as well that's saying this. Someone that should know better. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> It's true, and so this is what we're still faced with today. Have we moved away from that 1948 David Embry quote through to this? No, it's still the same. Um, so this really isn't, isn't helping things at all. Um, and this is modern day whiskey advertising. <laughs> this is what we're doing with it today as a whiskey industry. There are some breakaways, which we'll come on to in a minute, but I uh, quite like the mood board on this. <laughs> It's all the same. Same, same. Same, 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 right? We need to shake things up. So, hey, we're not, I'm not standing here going, you guys need to use it more with the cocktails. I'm actually standing here from a whiskey industry perspective saying, we need to, we need to sort this out. I was actually on this, um, I was about to say, the website of a governing body for Scotch. Um, and they had a Scotch whiskey cocktail section on their website, and they are the voice of the industry. And one of the cocktails, where is it? Was the, uh, the red scotch, a fiery blend of whiskey and tomato what? juice with Tabasco and Worcestershire sauce. Sounds delicious. <laughs> exactly what you want after a game of squash. One of their six cocktails. <clears throat> no, thank you very much. No. So if they're not talking about how we can use it properly, as I said, we need to change as an industry as well. So that's what we're doing. Um, Ryan, do you want to talk about the, uh, the next drink that we've got? Um, I'm going to apologize to the people who were <laughs> in the room for my last talk as well, because I've also messed up this drink. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sorry, is Ryan Chetty Award winner? Uh, I, I have no idea why it's acidic. It should be a, a very delicious whiskey and soda. Um, 
and I've clearly got to fuck something up. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> Uh, well, we have a dinner tomorrow night that I'm quite worried about now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so I apologize. Um, I, you know, uh, me ranting on about how a, a scotch and soda is, is my favorite drink, and two times now I've gone and Apart somehow from shots of citric it acid. I, <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I really don't know why there is any acidity in there. That shouldn't be there at but all. But what is the inspiration behind this? Let's so start with what it should be in theory. It should be a... Um, it, it's using some minerals and some subtle flavors to be able to lift out the notes subtle. within. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Textures, all those lovely things. It's, uh, it's just actually just a big glass of acid. Um, <laughs> uh, but it was there. It was nuanced to you know. I'm 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 a massive fan of of, of blended whiskey. And for those of you who have visited and any of the talks we've done for Dave and I's Heresy series about engaging with mixing with whiskeys and and the, and the power of blends. To me, the the, the highball is is amazing for that. It works wonderfully with a blended whiskey because you have that bed of the grain and underneath it. It's got that creaminess and it has those layers of flavor. You know, there's lots of different facets to um, the whiskey itself. It is something you can drink neat. I'm, I'm also a fan of that with blends. But just being able to open it out in this way, give it a bit of length, and it's that drink that you have a bit of time with. You can, you can as it starts to dilute, you get the, um, the carbonation carrying the flavors through and it should be able to release different flavors within it as it starts to open out. Um, I wouldn't encourage you to repeat trying this over and over again. Um, <laughs> ideally, it would start to showcase these different points as it started to, to open out, um, but I don't think that's going to happen. So apologies. <laughs> I still kind of chose. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to go really you sheepishly have to, you into have to my drink yours for punishment. <laughs> yeah, you have to drink yours. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, we've got another cocktail coming soon. It's okay, it's okay. <laughs> no pressure, Mike. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, okay, so that is modern day whiskey advertising. So there's really not much inspiration there as well. And again, do you see any sort of mixability on any of those adverts? Do you see anything apart from the fact that we're still showcasing mm -hmm. that Scotch should just be drunk neat? Or with, well, there's some ice in the Bell's picture, Jesus. I mean, you know, some whiskey enthusiasts would be turning in their grave. Richard Patterson would be throwing that ice across the, across the room. Um, so even having ice in that, in that advert is a, is a bold move. It's a bold move. But we need to shake this up, and we are shaking it up. You know, there are things like this that are going on. You know, whiskey companies are breaking out, and they're doing something different, and we are trying. We are realizing that that was, that was yesteryear, and this is today, you know? So you've got the ultimate bartender championship that Monkey Shoulder do. You've got the Ockentoshin and Ale thing that you experienced outside. That's a great initiative that's showing up all over the place, right? Um, you've got Love Scotch and what Diageo are doing with that and Hague Club and the fact that they promote Hague Clubmen to be served with Coke, right? And that is part of it. And, you know, say what you want about, about it, um, but it's a great way of showcasing that we need to go into this, this, this new old order, as, as Ockentoshin have said. And then you've also got the Scotch Egg Club from Dewars, where we pair whiskey, chickens, and games together in one um, and have fun with, with, with chicken hats, um, which, you know, something different, isn't it? Um, you ever paired Dewars with a, with a Scotch Egg before? No? Who knows who, what a Scotch Egg is? <laughs> <laughs> A fifth of you, that's correct. <laughs> <laughs> Whiskey pairs perfectly well with it. Tried and tested, okay? Um, I mean, what do you guys think of all of this? You know, obviously we've got the whisky, the advertising of today, and then we've got things like this. Now, there's a different... Do you, are you experiencing things like this? Are you seeing it? Are you seeing a change from, from the whisky <coughs> industry? Definitely. I think we're kind of starting to learn from our mistakes. But unfortunately, it's going to take a bit of time, I think, yeah. for us to see the impact of this. It's not going to happen overnight. No. We've got an ingrained kind of culture, particularly in Scotland and the UK, to, you know, still have that very much. You shouldn't mix, you shouldn't play around with it. It's not fun. It's for sitting around in a leather chair in the dark by a fire, drinking it neat, all that bullshit. And it's going to take time for that to kind of come full circle almost. And to be honest, it's it's not just a whiskey thing, it's actually a Scotland issue as well. We tend to really hang our hats on this 
tart and biscuit and bullshit. <laughs> There's some um, shortbread down the front as well. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. There you go. It's a, it's a country thing where we, we still market ourselves, you know, in an old-fashioned way, and you know it, that needs to change. You know, wholesale. The whole country needs to learn from that and and developing Scotch in the way that's advertised, in the way that that's sold and drunk. I mean, in Europe and and elsewhere, everywhere else actually probably is more forward-thinking with the way they drink. Scotch whisky than we are here in our home country, which is absolutely mind-blowing. But, yeah, they're definitely, and I think that has to be kind of brand-led as well, and I think it is being most of the kind of forward-thinking brands have seen the error of our ways, and you're starting to see it being yep. advertised and competitions like this and various different oh, things. I would say there still is a bit of a schizophrenia in terms of that, though. There is, um, you know, there is... There's this understanding that whiskey has always been mixed. It's n it's not a modern invention. In fact, the modern invention is that it shouldn't be mixed. And there's still this kind of two sides to the industry where we're recognizing how valuable it is. And I think that's also almost holding us back as well. So this is the idea that yes, we can do this side because we need to do something to engage. Um, but let's reserve that to this part so we don't damage or, or take that real risk with, with throwing whiskey into the 21st century. And there's a, there's a real danger that um, Scotch is resting on its laurels a bit, I think. Yep. Um, and it's, it, it's kind of, um, you know, presuming that because it's always been the kind of jewel in the, the whiskey crown around the world, that it will always hold that position. And I think there is a, a danger that if Scotch doesn't recognize what other countries, other whiskey producers are doing, um, it will get left behind, it will get shunted out the way. Yep, that's true. And, you know, as Mike said, it, it won't happen overnight, but it is happening and we are starting. So, as I said, this is an us versus them and us as an industry putting up, I'm not representing, obviously, the whole Scotch industry. <laughs> but we are changing things and we are moving away from that. And, and we have moved away from bagpipes, you know, with the, with the, uh, with the nice mood board there. You know, there, there aren't any bagpipes anymore. So yeah, it's, we're getting there. We're getting there. No kilts either. No kilts, no bagpipes, no, no shortbreads, short right? So, you know, we're, we're moving away from it slowly. Um, and sort of, and so we're about to go into a session on, we're gonna talk about flavor. Ooh, it's exciting, I love flavor. Um, but one thing that I want to point out, I think this is the next slide, before we go into that, is this. Okay? We're talking about breaking stereotypes here. Not all scotch <laughs> is smoky. Don't just use scotch whiskey in a cocktail to bring in a smoky element. And that is where it's being used too much at the moment. We talked about, um, well, the boys talked about how they got into whiskey earlier today, or earlier this morning. Um, and I mean, I was a bartender, um, as I said, in Edinburgh, and I didn't like whiskey. Uh, it was the drink that my dad drank, and you know, it, I, in my mind, it was still steeped in all of those stereotypes, but I wanted to like it, because when I looked up at my back bar, it took up over a third of the back bar, and I wanted to be able to give my own opinion on all of the whiskies on the back bar, because I wanted to be the best bartender I could be. So I started drinking it in cocktails as a gateway into whiskey. Right, but if a whis if if normal whiskey is is sort of you know it's an acquired taste, right? It's like coffee. Then Isla whiskey is it's a bloody sort of bachelor's degree. It's a master's. It's hard to get to. It is not approachable. And by just using whiskey for its smoky element in cocktails, you're segregating whiskey away further, and you're not looking at everything. We have over 115 distilleries in Scotland. And only a handful of them smoke their barley. Only a handful of them are PT. Don't just call on it for that. There are this, as I said before, there is this diverse array of flavors going into it. You just need to think about how you can use them a little bit more rather than just going to smoke. And I think that um, use of smoke in that way kind of perpetuates this myth. If, you're, if bartenders are only reaching for scotch to add an element of smoke, not only is that just kind of... Um, you know, in people's mind, it's, you know, it's, it's reinforcing the idea in the public's image that 
scotch will be smoky, it's also actually a disrespectful use of that smoke. You know, smoke is a wonderful element for bringing out different other flavors within it. It's not just the layer of smoke around it, and using it in that manner is just, uh, it's a, I think it's a very lazy way of using the, the whiskey. It is, and it's, it's actually, it's done because it's easy, I think, mm -hmm. and, and pulling out the really subtle nuances of whiskey is the most that's the fun bit. Part. But yeah. that's the fun bit, right? Challenging and fun, yeah. yeah. But really kind of going deeper into each individual expression of whiskey and working out what flavours you're trying to get from that rather than just, yeah, cool, peat, brilliant smoke. Great. Yeah, exactly. So speaking of that, as I said, it's not just smoke. We have all of this, yeah? We have this myriad of flavours going on within whiskey. You have this rainbow spectrum use it. So um, some of you might know Craig Harper and he said this, I said when do you use whiskey in cocktails? He says cocktails where the whiskey actually matters. That's where you need to use it. Um, and a rapscallion only works well with a peaty whiskey so it justifies the use of a cracking jam in it. But that thing, use it where it matters and it does matter. So just on that point I actually think um I, I love Sammy to bits, so I'm, I don't mean to continue to slag off the penicillin, but <laughs> I, I think it's... Um, but I'm going to anyway. You know anyway. <laughs> uh, you're sensing a theme with this, aren't you? Um, but it's... I, I think the Rapscallion's a drink that deserves a lot more um, attention. Um, Jacob was a little uh, dubious of the idea of it of being... Um, it was... Talisker was created on with PX and some absinthe, or Ricard. And it's... To me, that's a... a, a, a as Craig talks about, it's a... It's a nuanced use of this particular whiskey. It's, it's using a, a, a prestigious malt. It's using a smoky whiskey. Um, whereas, and it, it, but it's doing it with, with a plum. It showcases that it opens out the different sides to it. Whereas a penicillin is using smoke. That's what it is, it, it's, it's being tied together with. Yes, it can, you know, using a different whiskey at the heart of it, you can start to showcase different sides, but it's, it's, it's really a, a cold toddy with a layer of smoke in it. <laughs> I don't think Pretty you're much. the only person who thinks that, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, is that a warm-up for when we talk about Thank the penicillin you. in um, oh, the moment? Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, guys, ingredients. What pairs with scotch? What doesn't pair with scotch? What do you find works well? Flavour combination We talked about this works. before, didn't we? Yeah. We had yep. quite a long conversation about it, and essentially there's not really... I, don't, I can't think of anything that doesn't work. It's about finding the right whiskey to pair with each individual flavors, depending on whether you're using a nice or real grassy, light, young, you know, whiskey or something really sherry or, mm -hmm. you know, that flavor wheel kind of says it all really, doesn't it? Because yeah. different whiskeys hit different points. And, you know, Ryan particularly is very good for using, he's well known for using <laughs> unusual ingredients, <laughs> shall we That's say. A nice way of saying that. <laughs> <laughs> A weirdo. Um, so, and he uses stuff that really kind of play on qu quite unusual whiskies and, and, you know, really bring out subtleties of whiskey that I think is generally quite eye opening for, for the majority of us. So, any flavour combinations you found recently that you're like, yeah, that's Bula? Chocolate and orange. Chocolate <laughs> and orange, there we go. <laughs> Ryan? I mean, it's, it's very much as we, we discussed when we were discussing this panel and when we were picking up the conversations on this, there was, you know, that idea of this breadth of flavor. It, it's it's high, hard with the extremes. If you have something very, very subtle, um, and I, I am a vodka fan, I do think it has character, but you need to be able to, to apply a de delicacy to be able to use it. And it's the same with highly complex things. You know, you need to be able to apply a delicacy to be able to, um, to be able to, showcase a different side of it, highlight or bolster or whatever it is that you're trying to do with your cocktail. And I think with scotch, it, because it runs that gauntlet, you, you encounter those same, um, the, the same care and attention that's needed. And I think maybe that's potentially what's put people off. You know, you've got big collections of flavor or you do have very subtle flavors. Um, how can you pair things around it to make that shine? Um, but I don't think there's anything that scotch doesn't play well with. Um, and I don't think there's anything that it really can't kind of be able to, 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 take, to take being thrown at it as well. Yeah. And I think, you know, from a whiskey industry perspective as well, when you see bottles like this, 
which, by the way, won last week uh, world's best single malt whiskey. Yeah. I just want to throw that out there. Uh, <laughs> subtle plug on that one. Um, when you see bottles like this, right, there is so much in here. But, and I know we said that we, don't, we should be less precious as an industry, but at the same time, this isn't vodka. It wasn't made yesterday. This was, this was distilled 13 years ago. This was laid down in cast. This has been slumbering in a blanket of oak in the heart of Scotland for, for over 13 years. And I think we need to be a little bit respectful of that sometimes. You know, and this go, goes back to Craig's quote, which is, you know, use it where it matters. Don't just throw it in something any old, but use flavors that highlight certain elements of it. Try the whiskey first, neat of course we do with everything, but try it first. Let your imagination run wild with the flavors that you might be getting in that glass. If you need visual stimulus, look at something like a flavor world. This is from the Scotch Whiskey Research Institute, who are doing amazing things to do with research and um, innovation and just exploration of that scotch, right? Look at a flavor world, look at all of the flavors around it and let your imagination run wild. If you're smelling a whiskey and you smell fruit, Push it further. Is it stewed fruit? Is it dried fruit? Is it citrus? Is it, is it summer berries? Is it orchard fruit? Is that orchard fruit fresh? Is it dried? Is it in a crumble? You know, Push it further. And then from that and from your personal tasting notes, because remember this, all taste is subjective and we're all going to get different things from whiskey. We're all going to get different things from anything. But from that, take that, twist it, work with it, and see what other ingredients you can bring in to highlight those elements. I dare you to do that. I dare you to do that, to go and try it and push it further. But put it where it counts. Put it where it counts, all right? Um, okay, so that was that bit. Then, ah, yeah, so currently, I mean, what are, and we'll get to the cocktail in a minute, but what are the most successful whiskey cocktails at the moment? You know, we looked at the past and we've realized that actually that holy trinity of uh, scotch, vermouth, and bitters mm, might. <laughs> 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 <Sorry>. um, <laughs> so these are three cocktails that they are successful whiskey cocktails. So on the. I keep forgetting my left and my right. On the left, you have the penicillin, yeah, which, yes, there are some contested views here on it. I think oh, it's, it's, still, a, it's a delicious cocktail. I think it's a cracking cocktail. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's changed things. Hey, it's up there with the top 50. Finally, we're seeing something new with it that's not this same three combination or isn't a weird three combination of egg white and absinthe, right? So we have the penicillin, which is an awesome drink. We talk about twists on classics when normally you're looking at a menu. Make a twist on the penicillin. It's easy. It's right there in front of you and push it further. Um, in the middle, you've got the Koji Hard Shake, which is from... It's a bit weird, though. <laughs> <laughs> it is weird, but who's pushing it? Why is it weird, Ryan? Tell us. Um, so the Koji Hard Shake is, is a drink that's been on the Dan Line menu since we opened. Actually, it was one of the first drinks um, when we were putting together the Dan Line as a project that we, we came up with. Um, and it was... You know, actually, I think from all of the bars that I've, I've worked in, gone on to manage or, or open for ourselves, um, our whiskey drinks have been the best sellers. And it's the same with, with, with Dan Line and the, the Koji Hard Shake. And as we've kept a classic section, I think this is one that people have told us they will kind of come for our blood if they, we take it off the menu. <laughs> um, and a lot of people send people down to the bar to have it, which is wonderful. Um, it was the same I, I had at Whistling Shop with one of the drinks there. People were being sent down to have a whiskey cocktail, and I love that. Um, so it, it, in, its, in its essence, it's a kind of whiskey sour. Um, we use a little bit of cream in there, so it's, it's spiked towards, the, hence the hard shake reference. Um, we use some licorice bitters, and then we do a, a koji miso syrup. Um, so when it first started out, we were making koji, which, oh, Ariel's no longer here, but we, um, we were looking at taking this, the grain idea in a different way. So, when you taste these wonderful whiskies, and you, particularly with, with, with Craig Ellicke, you get this a lot, there's a, there's a big fruitiness in there as well. And all of these ma ma amazing flavors are, are coming from just the grain at the heart, you know, it's malted barley. Um, and so we wanted to showcase how there can be fruity notes, there can be rich kind of funky notes in there as well. Um, so we use a, the, the kind of koji to be able to bring that kind of set of flavors. Um, with a bit of licorice bitters, and we do a truffle marshmallow on the top. Um, but it's, it's, I suppose it, it does what you want with a, a blended scotch. It hits all the different parts of your palate. Um, everybody takes a sip, and they always kind of look away. It's, it's a bit weird on the first sip, 
um, but it draws you back in because it's got this fruitiness, a sourness, a saltiness, um, and then the richness of the malt, the spice, um, a creaminess. It kind of dances around all those different points. But it's a bit weird. Yep. Oh, we haven't got to questions yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, write it down and you can ask in the Q&A. <laughs> Um, no, that's a good point. It, it's not, I, I think we, this is one of the difficulties of, uh, actually I suppose white line and, and dan line, is they're not very um, replicable <laughs> things. Um, that's an understatement. Yeah. <laughs> so, that, um, so no, no, I haven't seen the take on it. <laughs> um, but the new project will have some of those things, and they will be replicable. So hopefully we'll be able to come up with a, a, a scotch drink that people will be able to have a go at. Yeah. And like, you know, as we were saying before, the, the one big modern classic is, is the penicillin, but there are others out there. And the reason that I've cho chosen these two is because they're homegrown, and we've got we've to we've look after one another, right? So the last one on there is one of my favorite scotch cocktails, which is the Campbelltown cocktail, um, which is from Bramble. Uh, yeah, it's an absolute belter of a drink, right? And that causes smoke, but but because it just because it works, just like with the rapscallion. It's quite a subtle sm amount of smoke in there, so it's not one of your traditional Isla whiskies. It's a like Campbelltown. It was it was done <laughs> it was done. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was actually I came up with it because. I, uh, we went to Campbelltown, and it felt like such a sad little place now. <laughs> um, and so we thought we'd put on a drink to try and kind of lift up uh, the, the people's perceptions, I suppose, of Campbelltown, because it's kind of the area that's almost forgotten. It's you a know, bit fighty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. A little bit. Um, again, it's bit. incredibly simple. It's a, it's a three-ingredient drink, but... Um, that's almost a challenge in itself to come up with something with such limited ingredients. Um, and the other two aren't vermouth and bitters. True, yes. Right. Cherry hearing and uh, green chartreuse. Finally, we've seen scotch and cherry hearing work in a, in a combination <laughs> that does work. Yeah. I, I do think it's... It, it, I, this is a drink I have, I have seen replicated, and actually it's um, a, a drink that when you read the ingredients, <laughs> I, I have to say, I, 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 was a, I, I thought it was going to be just a monster, you know, they're, they're big flavors there, but it's one of those drinks that's like the, the wonderful idea of a cocktail in, in personified. It's, you know, greater than the sum of its parts. And you taste that drink and it's got everything nuanced. Everything works and everything is in its right place and you can tell it's there for a reason. Um, and it's a, a drink that I think surprises a lot of people um, because it's, it, you know, it sounds like it's going to be a bruiser. It's only going to work for a very acquired palate, um, but it's actually very approachable as well. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think the, the greatest thing about the drink is you touched upon the smoke element. The, the, biggest, the biggest thing with regards to its flavor profile is that undertone of, of saline. You know, it's that salt element, and I think that, that regulates everything within the drink, and it, it's something that you don't find naturally in, in any kind of spirit, let alone scotch, the, the way that, you know, that salty kind of seaside element just kind of takes control and, mm. and kind of calms everything down. Yeah. Okay, so through to today, so we've done the past, <coughs> present, now we're coming into the future. Um, and apologies, the drink has been sitting in front of you for a while, but this, this is one of the, one of the ways that we, we can see the future of Scotch, right? As we've seen, there wasn't a lot of inspiration from the past. Our bartender forefathers and forefathers before then, they didn't set us up properly with whiskey, but we can set the next generation and the next generation after that up properly by doing right with whiskey how it should be done and how it should be used you can inspire the future and okay there might be not there might not be a lot of classics out there that call for whiskey so that's just you know still from another category so um you know this is a twist on a bramble that was exactly what we tried to do with, with <laughs> this drink because it was to show the the versatility of of just switching our, our scotch whiskey into a white spirit drink um, so I'm a massive fan of Craig Ellicky 13, so um, it kind of made number sense one, one. for me to use that in it. 
Um, obviously, traditionally, it's a gin drink, um, but this kind of drink is not. This is Fraser's name for it. It was called it's Mike's, called Mike's drink, drink. It was called this Mike's morning. drink. <laughs> It's Jacob's. Oh, is it yeah. Jacob's? It was literally called Mike's drink and Ryan was called Ryan's drink. But we had a guy work for us at Bramble 10 years ago who was doing it and he was calling it a scramble. So <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's not my drink by any stretch. It was merely just to show that you can switch scotch into a, a white spirit drink, a gin drink, and it, and it works. And I think you still get the complexity of the whiskey in there, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, and literally all we've done is... is shifted the measurement slightly, which is something that I think we've not really touched upon, which I think we should. Touch upon um, it now, his. But yeah, we've, <laughs> we've changed the recipes of a traditional bramble to try and make it work, and then the bitters just to tie it together a little bit. Um, but going back to the blood and sand, which is <laughs> one of the most infinitely polarizing drinks around, I think, um, judging by the research that Georgie did and, and seeing the amount of people that were either super positive or super negative it's about like it straight off the It's like the marmite of the cocktail world, it really is. Um, but for me, I'm, a f I, I, I'm pro the blood and sand because oh, I think it, it can work if you mess with the measurements. Now, Craig Harper's point was that if you mess with the measurements, then it's not really a blood and sand anymore. That's debatable whether that's the case or not, but I think the, the traditional equal measure doesn't really work no matter what scotch you use in it. But depending on what scotch you use and when you tweak the measurement slightly, I think a blood and sand can be a very good drink. And that's what um, they do in Jim Meehan's uh, PDT cocktail book. They've got a blood and sand in it, but they've messed with the measurements. Have they? Yeah. So the polish your turd, basically. <laughs> <laughs> You wanted to get that in. You really <laughs> wanted to get that in, did you? Like I said, a polarizing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in your in your dramble, in your scramble, you actually have Mike's new um, bramble liqueur yeah. as well. Um, <laughs> Again, protecting our own, showing what we have in Scotland. Well, I have to say, I think it works nicer. Than, well, we were talking about this before, and I'm not blowing smoke, smoke up my ass for this, but it's got, um, you know, it's got a herbal element to it that works. You know, Craig Ellicke's a, a complex malt. It's got a fruitiness, but it's got that, it's got a funk to it. It's got a meatiness, yeah, and absolutely. it's got a herbal yep. note. And I think that actually, I, I think this is super delicious. Um, and it's, it, it all ties together with that, you know, slightly... Um, you know, obviously there's the fruitiness in there from the, from the brambles as well, but there's that like herbal citrusy note that, that helps lift out more, more flavor from within the whiskey as well. Right. And, you know, and the three cocktails that we've had today as well, something else to note before, before we finish is that two of them have been with single malts. And again, that's something that a lot of bartenders before traveled around the world quite a bit. And Barton's like, oh, God, you can't put a single malt in a cocktail. But it is single, and it is ready to mingle. It is ready to pop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you God. definitely wanted to get that in there. <laughs> I just thought about it. <sighs> I was like, that's... <laughs> <laughs> Bell with the dad jokes. <laughs> <laughs> but it is ready to go out there. Again, as long as you use it properly. But don't be precious about it. Hey, both a blend and a single malt. They're both a marriage of casks. Just one of them is from one single distillery and another is from, you know, a, up to 40, 50, whatever amount of distilleries. But there's still the art and the craft that goes into blending a single malt and, and, a, and a blend. It's the same. So use single malts in cocktails, right? Do what you want with it. Use them appropriately. Appropriately. And Well, no, that's what we're going back to. Use them appropriately, but do use them. All right. Um, so that is, is the future. Um, one final question for you guys. So obviously we're looking at the future now. Um, how do you think whiskey can play, play a role in the future? Obviously we've got some interesting trends out at the moment, which is like mindfulness, sustainability. We're looking at genderless marketing, which obviously we need to work on a little bit. Um, <laughs> what, what do you think the, the future holds? I think with, with some of those things that you, you, you've touched on as, as trends, I think um, almost I think that's just us getting back to a, what should be a default position. I think what's coming next is, is people, you know, a lot of people are worried that the next generation aren't drinking or they're not engaging in the same way. And I, th I, I don't believe that to be anything close to the truth. Well, not that they're not drinking more, but I think that it's more about their drinking in a different consideration and one of the nice things that is, you know, transparency is a very um, 
kind of hotly debated topic at the moment. And I think it's, it's, it's more the fact that people want to have an engagement. They want to be able to, to understand more. It's, it's, it's a great position that we're in. And I think people are drinking less because they're drinking better. Yeah. And um, you know, with, with, with what's going on with Scotch, I think it is about that, that conversation going on more in an open manner um, and people being able to, you know, we, we got asked in, in one of the classes, you know, what do you think to using um, you know, the, the brand's role in the creativity. And I think now bartenders are much more excited by delving into the stories of the brands because it provides an inspiration right. and it provides a conversation. And it's, it's, it's part of what the consumer is interested to. Um, so I think, well, I'm hoping we're going to see more of a, a considered use, not only of the liquid, but also of the, the brand, the space, why it's being used and, and, and how that's opened up to, to the people who want to engage with it. Hey. Um, yeah. No. No. Okay. Um, I, 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 I don't know. I think, I think while, while a lot of people in this room, especially us on stage, have been quite lucky to inherit to a certain extent um, a taste for scotch, like with, through, ever, through ever which way, um, we have to bear in mind that a lot of our generation, um, whether it be um, Gen X or the millennials, have shunned, have shunned what it is that their parents liked, um, you know, just through sheer rebellion. So there's a lot of people who, who don't like whiskey um, and who don't like scotch um, simply for, for no good reason. Um, and I think something, something as simple as, 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 ed, as education is, is, is pretty key. Um, not in terms of how you should drink it and how you shouldn't drink it, but um, how would you like to drink it? If you did want to drink it, how would you want to consume it? Um, I think those are some of the key, uh, some of the key questions that should be asked uh, going forward um, and with, I think with, with regards to this industry and, and, yep. and drinkers, yeah. But I think it's almost, you know, we talked a bit about us and them, and I think the, the education needs to be actually on both sides. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think we are, there's been a lot of um, myths from, from kind of both sides, and absolutely, I think the, uh, the, the public want to engage, they want to be, and we need to be able to talk to them, but I think we need to be able to... Uh, this, why I love these kind of discussions, it's, it's almost in amongst ourselves as well about um, what you can and can't do and yep. where we see the future. And, you know, as Mike, to Mike's point earlier, it's not going to happen overnight. Um, but we saw with, with the different initiatives that are going on with brands, the Scotch Egg Club, the Ockentosh and Ale, Love Scotch, etc. You know, education is ramping up. Obviously, we can't just go out, hey, we're going to educate you, right? But subtly, it's coming into play. Um, and, and the education at every level as well, not not like formal education, like sit down and do a training session, but you know, just chatting amongst your peers. Like this yep. is something we do all the time. We go and we sat and we had a dram and we shared them around and we chatted about them. And like I, there was a dram that I'd not really had before. Like the distillery was pretty. I'd heard of it, but I'd never really tried it. Ryan knew more about it than me, so. He was telling me about it, and then so I walked away, you know, knowing more about it. And I'm quite a, you know, passionate about Scotch whisky, but there's massive areas, you know, that I don't know about because it's such a varied playground. You know, there are all those distilleries, and all of those distilleries do different expressions, and some of them do entirely different brands. That you know, it's really difficult to try all of them, to yeah. try every single expression of every single, and you know, be, you know, aware that there is always more learning that you can do and that you can kind of pass on to your peers or your workmates or your people that work for you or, or brand guys, you know, and, and brand guys that come in and, you know, do care enough about the category as a whole and not just their brand to go and learn more and, you know, uplift the whole industry because, you know, it, it's fascinating, it's massive, it's vast. Yeah, right. And. You know, that, that's a good thing. That's what, that's what we do, and that's actually what we've kind of done, is sharing's caring, right? And supporting, yeah. And supporting. Yeah. Yeah. So open that bottle of whiskey that you have lying there that you've been like, oh, I'm waiting for a special occasion. Your special occasion is to get together with your friends and to drink it with them and to try it with them and share knowledge about it and bounce ideas about flavor across the table. I used to work for the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, and that's what we did on our tasting panel to choose our, our next cast that we were going to use. We all sat around a table and we talked about the flavor that was inside. And your flavor ideas will inspire yours, it will inspire yours, it will inspire yours. And that makes it fun. And that means that, again, you can go on and use whiskey appropriately 
in cocktails, and that will stem from that. Cool. So, thank you very much. <laughs> that wasn't a smooth ending, I realised that. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got time for questions. Yeah. Sorry, that wasn't a very smooth ending. Basically, summarizing all of this is, is use it. Use, use whiskey appropriately, and we hope that you've been inspired by that. Try it. Explore flavors. Explore different dimensions. Beg, borrow, still from other spirit categories. As we said, there isn't a lot of inspiration from the past, but today you can make the inspiration that the future's past will be inspired by, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, we have some time for questions. So does anyone have any questions or any opinions or any burning thoughts around this or any flavor combinations that actually you found have worked really well with whiskey? Hi. Uh, the idea is that why we can uh, try to support an industry trying to selling cocktails with no test of whiskey. Of course, there's a, a, a lot of uh, options that are not only a whiskey sour, but I think that the, the, the first step is it's about the trade. Because yeah. when, when we, I'm, I'm from Barcelona, Spain, of course it's not, we don't have the same uh, culture of cocktails like other parts of Europe, but when a trade does something with the press or all these kind of things, they're trying to uh, hide the whiskey all the time. I, I, I think your, your, your point about support is, is crucial there. So when you're seeing something being done that is maybe pushing the boundaries, is doing something different, is, is putting whiskey in a way that's unusual to people, it is, it's about the, the trade peers, people getting behind that. And I think there's, you know, there's several times where it's, it, it's the brands need to be able to be supportive of that. So if, if everybody was just doing the same thing, it's, it's not going to encourage somebody to, to step outside because they're not getting that, um, that kind of swell behind them. And it's, I think it's across everything. It's across how people treat it in, in, in books. So Dave's book, The, the Whiskey Manual, um, that to me is, is, is what it should be about. It's taking everything and talking about how you can enjoy it in different ways. And it was very usable. And it was great to see that blends and malts people got behind that. And I think it's the same with the cocktails. If, if people are doing single malt cocktails or, or being very bold with the spirit and there needs to be enough support behind it, otherwise it's not gonna encourage people to do it more. It's not gonna encourage to, to open it. It's not gonna encourage people to use it in that way. Um, and I, I think this is something that both the trade and um, the, the, the kind of industry have, have, have been quite guilty of. We haven't supported those things. We haven't um, encouraged people to to put whiskey at the heart of it, as like you say. Yeah. And that, again, falls into the appropriateness angle as well, which we've been talking about before. So, thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Yes. Um, you were talking earlier about the, I mean, the kind of the issue with Scotch having this leather, wood, and so on. And you talked about how there's kind of an effort to move forward from that and to the used hay club as an example. Do you think, I mean, any of you, uh, there's any industry, not any, any categories, this is probably the closest one, but any other industries that have similar problems that Scotch could particularly learn from and kind of move on in a similar way? I mean, I think we've probably got the same uh, problem as maybe cognac or brandy with the, the stigma associated with it. Um, um, yeah, I'd agree with that. Yeah, um, but then I suppose we, we can learn from um, I was talking about the highball earlier, right? We can learn from the gin industry. We can see what they're doing and how they're highlighting their flavor and how they really emphasize and accentuate that in, in their drinks. And perhaps we need to shout about it more and as an industry make, make our flavor distinctions more obvious to help. So I think from that perspective, you know, I think, I think we can learn, learn from there. Um, I think we can also be bold and learn, and learn from beer as well. Um, we're seeing sort of craft beer rising um, all over the world, right? And uh, brewers having fun with it. Uh, just, just to follow on from that point, um, I, I think and I've been kind of brazen and, and probably a little more rude than I usually would be. But <laughs> with, um, no, it's about. <laughs> uh, with, with, with cognac, I think there's a lot to learn from cognac's mistakes with that because I think it is very similar in every year. I get an approach being like, right, we're going to bring cognac into the public by doing cocktails. 
And it's the same thing every year. It's the same cocktails, it's the same spiel, and it's, it's, it's a bit of a, a stuck record with it. And I think Scotch can learn that it's not just about looking back to look forward. You need to be able to embrace it and be able to be actually have the balls enough to actually go out and do something different with it. And I think that's crucial, and I think it's very important for Scotch to do it because you know, you're looking at these other like other whiskey markets from around the world, and they're not shackled by those things. Um, and I think the craft beer is a, is a, is a very uh, good example in it because they're not, you know, looking forward doesn't mean you've got a jettison tradition and, and, and heritage and all those wonderful things, um, but you can make it relevant to, to a new audience. Um, and that, that's the craft beer market have done that wonderfully, where they've got, you know, that. They're in every supermarket now. They're in every bar you go to has got this range, and you're still stuck with three bottles of the same whiskeys in a lot of places. Yeah, you know, I think if if we if we are to move Scotch into the to the to the future, is it, it's about being relevant. And um, I think the I Scotch think cognac and cognac angle well. is quite interesting because <laughs> there's a definite sort of similarity between them, and they're they're kind of caught in the past a little bit, and they've they've spent too long telling people about how much care and attention goes into making things and how many years and they're in dark places and you know the, the craft which which is interesting and relevant and part of the story but almost then becomes this revered thing that because it's spent so long in a barrel you know it's this old it's you know this much care and attention has been taken to it that oh god well you should probably not really mix it and i think you know it's really important to get away from that i think one of the other kind of <clears throat> categories to kind of answer your question that I think we're seeing um, the Scotch industry kind of taking little um, pointers from is, is bourbon, is the American whiskey category. And you can actually physically see from a design and advertising perspective, mm. some brands particularly yeah. really borrowing from, from that. And I think that's a good thing because they're probably more modern thinking and they can be because they're not governed by the same rules, and that's a whole different discussion altogether if we get into the SWA and their, their role in this, and, and Cognac have a similar sort of thing where they're governed <coughs> so they can get away with a lot less um, from an innovation side of things than, than American whiskey can, for example. Yeah, but the Scotch Whiskey Association are there to protect yeah. the integrity, the quality, the reputation of Scotch around the world, and really yes. to protect the consumer. Yes, so that you which know they've that, done a great job of. Which we've yeah. done a great job of, and it means that when you pick up a bottle of Scotch, you know what's in that bottle. You know it has to be made and matured in Scotland, uh, matured in their cost for a minimum of three years. You know it's only made from three raw ingredients. You know there's no unicorn tears in there. Right? Yeah. So, I'd and you can't say, yes, we can learn from American whiskey, but you can't say the same there because you can walk into, a, into an off license in America and you look at the array of, of whiskey on offer there from, a, from the American whiskey perspective. And half the time, you, you can't be sure of what's in the bottle. No. Yeah, I think, I think the, the subject highlighted about the cognac comparison might actually be well, one of the most pertinent topics within this talk because. Um, again, not to, not to brand bash or be disrespectful, but I think, I think the way that cognac and specific, uh, branding, specifically cognac is, it's probably a little bit further down the road than Scotch is with regards to where it is uh, culturally. With, you know, when you were saying about you know, cognac coming back into cocktails, it almost seems like a knee-jerk reaction because they're so, they're so far down the road or so far behind, however you want to term it. Um, they're only saving graces that the, you know, the, they've gone into markets like China and India and probably Brazil where they've managed to make money off it. But I, I do think if, if Scotch, uh, if, it, if it doesn't take a step back and, and, and ask some questions, um, if you're wondering where it's going to be, look at, look, at where, look at where Cognac is now. So we need to stop that. We're not going to get to that situation. You can see things are, things are changing. Right. The wheels are in motion and we're right. changing yeah. it. Did, did that answer that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's obviously a good question because everyone wanted to speak about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Uh, so you're about using, uh, Hold on, a lovely lady here with the mic is coming to save your voice. <clears throat> so uh, you're talking about um, taking care in using uh, malts and and the whiskey. Um, have you seen highball being uh, a good malt using in a highball? Because I know. 
um, the blend and the grain helps. It's maybe a little bit more approachable with that, the soda, but or other mixer. Is there anything? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this. Not to keep on going on about this, but this works really well in a highball. They all work really well in highballs. Yeah. You know, they all do. Whether it's sort of a, obviously with your lighter styles, you've got to be careful because you could drown the flavour out and dilute it too much. But if you're looking, if you look at the sort of the flavour spectrum of, of scotch, I'd avoid the the this ends. This you might want to put in sort of something that's a little bit more, more delicate, but definitely sort of from sort of midpoint down into your sort of from your fruity numbers all the way through to your big smoky whiskies. Um, if you've ever had a, I know we said not all whiskey is smoky, but if you've ever had a, a smoky whiskey and soda, it's, it's absolutely banging. So I, I think it is about, and as my role as sales ambassador for Dale's, Dave's book, I'd say it's. Um, <laughs> It, He's got it, a bag of them. It, it's yeah. like, <laughs> but it, you know, yeah. Well, <laughs> tasting them across and going, some work with with certain mixers, and you know, it, tasting them all with soda means you. It, of course, some there's a salinity to, to to a soda water. There is a, a dryness to it. If if you've got a very dry whiskey, sometimes dry and dry is is not what you need, but. Um, if you take something, as, as Georgie said, if it's got a bit of a, a grassiness, a, a citrusy note, a, a, a little lick of smoke, you, you're really opening that out. And I, I'm, I'm a very much in, in the same camp as Georgie, where I kind of see single malts as cocktails, just in a different way. It's a, a different palette for it, but it's, uh, sorry, like blends or cocktails, same thing. Um, <laughs> but it's, I think it depends on the, the, the whiskey, and you, you do find ones that, that really sing in, in a highball. I think that's kind of the beauty of a highball, though, mm. using different whiskey in it. They, they, for something that is so simple as base ingredients, they're so different depending yeah. on what whiskey you use. And that's before you even start messing about with it, before you add bitters or look Still at garnishes garnish. or, yeah. or, you know, <laughs> acid. Kind of, or acid, yeah, yeah. Or, or any of the crazy shit that you end up doing yeah. in it, but that's as its, <laughs> as its core, and then you can get really technical with it and talk about the effect of different soda waters or sparkling waters or whatever, you know, you've got like these ones that have a, like a salt content that when you involve that with different kinds of whiskies, then, you know, this drink that's ultimately so simple can yeah. be yeah. here on the flavor spectrum depending on the one the one reason. thing that we didn't touch upon lagavulin and coke you're welcome mm. <laughs> yeah try try a lagavulin and coke and tell me you don't like it and i'll show you a liar <laughs> <laughs> all right well on that note because we're coming up to time close um first of all i want to thank our caps at the back uh you guys have been amazing thank you very much <laughs> Um, love to thank our AV guys and our filming guys for sorting everything out for us and making sure that our dulcet tones can be carried on. Yeah. And finally, I'd like to thank all of you for coming down. Oh, I want to thank the panel as well. Um, but I'd like to thank all of you for coming down and, and really making this for us. As I said, this is for us to do this. This is, this is awesome. So yeah. thank you very thank you. much. Thank you.